And hello, everybody. Welcome to the Jim Masters Show live all around the world. I am your host, Jim Masters. It's a true pleasure to have you with us. And thanks to you for joining us right now as we have an amazing guest coming up in just a second. Yes, I'm going to tell you who it is in just a second. I just want to tease you a little bit. First, I would like to toast all of you, as we always do. This is an Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series that we started 21 weeks ago every single day. I can't believe it. Think about that. Almost 150 episodes every single day, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific Live. A lot of uh, light and love and levity abounds here, or levity as we call it. You learn something. There's a lot of information, education, knowledge building here on the show. Good times, smiles, and of course, having you here makes it uh, so much more phenomenal. And uh, we're so excited to have an opportunity to share with you these shows on a nightly basis because we get a chance to connect with folks literally from around the world. So I toast you and you and you and you and you. We do this every show with our toast. We just have a little light ginger ale here in the glass, the big uh, wine glass, just ginger ale tonight. Mmm. Every once in a while, just some cool, refreshing ginger ale. You know, it does the trick. And uh, we have Fania Williams here on the show, and she is a brilliant, brilliant independent uh, international director, uh, also our artistic theater director for uh, Brighton Theater. She is live in London right now, so we really appreciate her doing this because it's like midnight there in England, so we appreciate her joining us live from London. Also, in addition, she's a BBC producer. She's a multi-award winning producer and director. And she's worked on extraordinary films and television projects and documentaries and so much more. And we're so excited to have her here on the show to talk about her career, but also to talk about her passions and her inspirations in life. And also to find out about some of the amazing projects she's worked on and some of the really inspiring and really cool projects that she's working on right now. So she's going to be with us live from London in just a second. But as always... We're very viewer-centric here on the show. We want to welcome everybody who's watching from all around the world, all points of the globe, watching live right now on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. I just want to thank all of the new folks who have subscribed to our YouTube channel. It's extraordinary. So many people have popped onto the YouTube channel where we house all of the episodes of our series. This episode is streaming live from there now. It'll be archived there. All the past episodes, 21 weeks of night after night episodes and a couple of pop-up shows and food festivals and day shows we've done as well. Every episode is there for you for the viewing pleasure and for your enjoyment right there on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, I would encourage you to, uh, as of October 1st, which is this coming Thursday, uh, Facebook is not going to allow any live streaming of music. So, if we have a musical guest, um, singer, music, uh, Facebook isn't allowing anybody anywhere as of October 1st, this Thursday, to uh, stream music. So, we are all about YouTube anyway, where we have started this show. So, we're going to be broadcasting specifically the music themed shows where the artist has music involved from Thursday, October 1st forward on YouTube, as well as Periscope and Twitch. Right now, we're on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, and Twitch at Jim Masters TV. We're going to stay on Facebook, staying on YouTube, Periscope, and Twitch. But if we have a musically-themed guest where music is front and center, then it's just going to be YouTube, Periscope, and Twitch, all at Jim Masters TV, because Facebook is making some big changes a lot of it has to do, I guess, with copyright and legalities and all of that. It's a big, big thing that they're doing. So a lot of people are you know, shifting around what they're doing. Fortunately for us, we're not uh, just a musically oriented program. We're an entertainment lifestyle talk show series where we cover all ground, all genres of life, Broadway, Hollywood, television, music, film, science, nature, health, wellness, inspiration, culinary arts, sports, comedy. We do it all here on our show. Guests from all walks of life and fields of endeavor. So we're pretty good. Uh, we'll be still on Facebook at Jim Masters TV with our shows as well. But just the nights where we have music, uh, that's going to be just on YouTube. 
Periscope, and Twitch. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Click the notification bell so you don't miss any of the episodes of our fun series here that we've been doing night after night right here exclusively for all of you. Thanks for all the great comments. I'm gonna check in with some of the viewers around the world. Christine is here reporting for duty. Christine Clifton watching on YouTube at Gym Masters TV from North Carolina, USA. Good evening, Jim and Lovety friends. Everybody here is called the Lovety. And that's a word I sort of stumbled on when I was saying the show is all about light, love, and levity. And I slipped up and I said levity and everybody fell in love with it. And that's officially a term used uh, to describe our show. It's all about levity. And uh, all the viewers are levities. All the guests become levities. And uh, <laughs> Fania is going to be immediately inducted into Levity Hall just as soon as she pops on. Good evening, Jim and lovely friends from North Carolina. We look forward to the fascinating conversation with award-winning director, producer, uh, Fania Williams tonight. Uh, we welcome her to Lovely Hall. Absolutely. I'm right there with you on that. Christine and uh, Mary Bishop, welcome Jim and Fania and the Loveties. Looking forward to another show filled with positivity. Watching on YouTube, Mary Bishop, for those of you who you didn't see the full show last night with uh, incredible singer, songwriter, actor, extraordinaire Michael Longoria, who was in Jersey Boys, who was in the Midtown Men. We had a great time with my buddy Michael. You can see that again on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. We announced that our viewer of the week now, where we celebrate one viewer who's been doing all kinds of great things, um, spreading the word about the show and showing levity and everything, Mary Bishop is the viewer of the week. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to congratulate Mary Bishop, now is the time to do it. She's the viewer of the week on the Gym Master Show Live. Something special we like to do for our faithful viewers, levities that watch from around the world. So congratulations, Mary. Once again, thank you for making me viewer of the week. It really touched my heart. My pleasure. Good to see you, Mary, from uh, Southern California, SoCal, USA. Anne is here. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, Anne. Uh, Merlin in Interkip, Ontario, Canada is here. Hi, Jim and everyone. Good to see you, Merlin. Wichita, Kansas. Marilyn is here. Hello, Jim and all lovelies. Good to see you as well. Jennifer Barry is here. Wiggles on the couch. She's wiggling. She was wiggling. She likes our theme music in the beginning and the end, so she wiggles to that. It makes her zen. Uh, hello, everyone. For Claudia Bartow. Good to see you, Claudia. Thank you for joining us. In the Netherlands, Willie is here. Hello, everyone. Have a nice evening. Hello, dear friend Jim Boy. Thank you, Willie. I love it. Just across the channel there from where you are in the Netherlands, our very special guest is uh, Fidia Williams in London, England. Good to see you in Holland, Willie. And from South Africa, Juanita. Hello, Jim and everyone. Good to see you as well in South Africa. We love having you here, Juanita. North Carolina, USA. Hi, Jim and all lovelies. Hope you've had a great day. We sure have. And uh, I know after our show, everybody's going to be watching probably the presidential debate so uh, we're going to keep our show on track tonight because I'll be watching it too. It's going to be something, I tell you. Probably more levity on this show than there will be on that tonight. <laughs> so you better stock up on your levity here on our show. Good evening, Jim and everyone. Uh, hope today has been a wonderful day for all. Absolutely. Good to see you, Anne, in New York City. Hi, Jim and everyone. Kathleen Walker. Good to see you, Kathleen. And when I do the toast with the glass, everybody does toasting and cheering, and we love that. Good to see all the toasts from everybody, all the loveties from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Our great friend, Karen Ayani. Good to see you, Karen. Welcome to the show. Hope you're doing well in, uh, I think you're now officially retired from the University of Pittsburgh, right? You, you had a few days left and that was it. Congratulations. And again, I think, what, 43 years at the university? A job well done. Next time I'm in Pittsburgh, we will toast in style to that accomplishment, my friend Karen, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Francis is here. Good evening, everyone. Toast to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Francis. You're having iced tea. Uh, viewer of the week, Willie, was Mary Bishop. Mary Bishop is the viewer of the week. Our dear friend June is here. June Rachelson Aspa, New York City. Fania is super wonderful. Absolutely. I agree she is. Very accomplished as well. Good to see you, June. Kathy is here. Good evening, Jim and Lovities from Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Watching the Tribe in the MLB playoffs, oh, Major League Baseball playoffs. My Mets are out, so <laughs> New York Mets. Welcome, Fania, to the Gym Master Show from Willie across the channel there in Holland in the Netherlands as well. Let's see. Um, are they going to allow sharing from YouTube to Facebook? Um, 
Probably not. I would doubt that because any music that's on Facebook, they're going to block it or delete it or, uh, yeah. So no, I wouldn't see any sharing happening with that. Not on Facebook. So the best thing is to go to YouTube. Again, only when we have musical guests. Every other guest, and we have a lot that are non-musical, perfectly fine. It will always be here on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitch. But when it's specially like a singer or, you know, a musician, it's going to be on YouTube, which is where the dominance of everything is anyway, where we house all of our shows. So, yeah, they'd probably block you doing that share that you're talking about. Uh, if you subscribe to YouTube, you'll also still be able to comment, too. Everybody comments on YouTube, just like they do here on Facebook. Uh, welcome, uh, Fania, to Lovety Hall and Christopher, Joseph. Hello, Jimbo, and all the Loveties. Good to see you in Ohio. Yes, you can send comments on YouTube. Yes, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel at Gym Masters TV, you will be able to comment as well. Good stuff. Congratulations, everybody, saying to Mary for being viewer of the week. A lot of great comments coming in here. And uh, Annette is here. Hi from Brighton. Wow, she's right there in Brighton, England. Welcome, Annette. Nice to have you here. I know it's late where you are after midnight. My guest on um, my guest on Sunday is George Hutton, the Irish pop star, singer, songwriter, and uh, lyric tenor. Uh, he's going to be live from uh, Ireland, and it'll be midnight for him as well. Uh, I've got a couple guests where it's like 1 a.m. for them, like Sweden coming up as well. It's good to see everybody. I want to welcome my very special guest because we have a lot of wonderful conversation and great things to get to today. Good to see that everybody is doing well and you're all faring well. And I welcome my illustrious guest, Fania Williams. Welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. And it's Hello. nice to have you on Lovety Hall here at the Gym Master Show Live. <laughs> Hello, Jim. And congratulations to Mary Bishop for being viewer of the week. That's absolutely amazing, I think. And I actually, while you were talking, I got on a very fast train and I came to my home in Brighton. I'm not in London. So that's, I know Annette from Brighton. And I so know. you know her? Is she a neighbor or a friend or is she with the theater? A Facebook friend, a theater friend. Yeah. Yeah. So that, Fantastic. Was, that was really nice. Really so nice. for folks that are watching right now who are trying to think of the positioning of Brighton from London, how far away would you say Brighton is from London? It's about 50 miles. It's about 49 minutes on a fast train. Um, and most of my work, obviously, is from London. BBC is in London. Um, and it's just wonderful coming home at night from a theatre or something on the train. You get off the train at Brighton Station and you smell the sea and it is fantastic. Very nice. Now, your husband, uh, you mentioned, is from... Uh, Yorkshire, and that's where the master's side, my father's father's side of the family, hailed from initially before they came over to the States to land in New York, came from Yorkshire as well. Beautiful area, isn't it? We we've mm -hmm. lived, went back and lived there for quite a while when I was fellow in theatre at Bradford University. We love Yorkshire. My children went to school there. They crossed the moors in high-heeled shoes because that's what you do when you're a teenager. <laughs> And um, we loved living there. We love Yorkshire. Very, very. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We hope to, we hope to make a trip over there soon. Uh, it must be why I love pudding so much. Yorkshire pudding, maybe. <laughs> we have a lot of welcomes here for you, and thank you for being you know up late for us there in uh, in the UK. We really appreciate that. Anne is watching on YouTube. She says, "Welcome to you." Welcome, Fania. We appreciate that from Anne. You're going to get a lot of lovety. This is the, 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 a lot of lovety is expressed on this show. I, I think you you got that memo right. You've watched us some of the shows. You see all the lovety. <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, the world needs more lovety. Uh, yeah. From Wichita, Kansas, USA. Welcome, Fania. So uh, late your time being after midnight. Thank you for coming in. Uh, in 2019, Willie, who's in Holland, was in wow. Brighton. Nice place. She enjoys it. So she was there last year. Jennifer wow. says, I'm English, Irish, Scottish, on my daddy's side, Italian, on me mom's side. She's in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Christine in, uh, oh, in North Carolina says, welcome, Penny, to Lovety Hall. You are now a Lovety. That's it. You've been inducted into Lovety Hall. You've worked all your life. 
All those multi-awards, but no award tops being an official lovety on the Gym Master Show, right? Aren't you tingling? <laughs> I'm tingling. <laughs> I'm just amazed at all these um, incredible audience, the incredible audience that you have. And they always send greetings and quotes and all sorts of things. It's wonderful. You've built up such a fan, a fan base. Thank you very much. Yeah, we really, uh, in the 21 weeks we've been doing it every single night, almost 150 episodes, we've really created a beautiful community here that just continues to grow and expand around the world. Case in point, welcome to the show, Fania from Juanita in South Africa as wow. well. Yeah, and she watches every night. Jennifer Cobb, hello, Jim. Welcome, Faye. She's here. She's welcoming you. Christopher uh, Joseph in Ohio, USA, loves your English accent. Absolutely. <laughs> Jennifer Barry says, hey, Fania, Jen is Zen. She's Zen. She's happy. Claudia I'm welcomes you. Mary Bishop's thanking you for congratulating her on being viewer of the week. Crystal in Connecticut. Uh, hi, Fania. Welcome to the show. Kathy Short is welcoming you as well. Mary Bishop welcomes you. Christopher Joseph welcomes you. <laughs> If you're ever down in the dumps, just join us on our show. <laughs> That's it. All the lovity, all the lovity here. So good stuff, good stuff. And Kathleen welcomes you from New York City as well. Well, let's talk about this. Um, ex oh, let's see. Christine says, this year I discovered BBC detective shows so much better than ours. <laughs> the BBC ah. does put out great uh, product. We're still watching on, on PBS. We're still watching Patricia Rutledge. Um, in uh, keeping up appearances. <laughs> All the Britcoms, the British comedies, they love over here so much. Just the actress. She was in one of my husband's plays, actually. Patricia? Uh, yeah. uh, she, she's a national treasure. She is an yeah. absolute national treasure. And, and the wit that she, she the versatility, because there's that other series that she played where she was sort of like this detective, right? There was another, because they're showing that here in the States, too, which, and it has a little humor. She's a detective with the, uh, the young lad who's sort of like her assistant. And um, I forget the name of it, but she's really good uh, in that. But Betty something invested Yes, yes, exactly. Her, her range is really just ama amazing. Uh, from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Hello, Fania. Nice to meet you as well. Brett's channel says hi as well. Fantastic. So, Hetty Wainwright. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. It's, that's exactly. And, and on keeping up appearances, it's uh, Hyacinth Bucket, but if you ask her, bouquet. <laughs> that's right. So let's talk about your amazing career and your background. How did you first get into, you know, the world of production and film and theater and, and television and all of it? What were some of those early, I mean, I love it because I've, you know, I work in this industry as well. So we're kindred spirits in that way. Um, what were some of those things that inspired you to start really approaching this work and really diving in the way that you have? I think it began, I, um, I was a sort of child bride. Um, I married my first husband. I was married for eight years. And then very sadly, as so often happens these days, he died of cancer. And I went, I was in, living in London, in Notting Hill Gate. And I moved from there to Oxford to go to Oxford University. I decided I'd do something that occupied my mind. Um, and so I was at St. Anthony's College in Oxford doing a graduate degree, um, postgraduate degree. and. Um, we used to work in the morning, play tennis in the afternoon, and then I wondered what to do in the evening. And I discovered drama, I discovered the theater, <laughs> and I founded my own theater company, which we called Oxford Free Theater. And we called it Oxford Free Theater because we wanted to see how long one could go on in the world of the arts for free. We didn't charge the audience to come, because we were Oxford Free Theatre, people gave us all our props and all the things we needed for that particular show. People would give us a venue and they, they would house us. Um, and I thought this was working rather nicely, this idea of a free theatre. Um, but I found we could go on for free for two years and then we had to become 
we were professional, but we had to behave like proper professional people and involve money. And that was the sort of start of it. But um, I just, I've always loved the theatre. My mother was at the theatre when I started uh, to come, to be being born. She had to rush to the nearest place. So I, in a way, I come out of theatre. Um, and um, when I got to Oxford and founded my own company, I could work with the most interesting contemporary playwrights, as well as doing the classics. Everybody wanted to do drama at Oxford and Cambridge, where my husband was. Um, and that's really how I started Oxford Free Theatre. That's fantastic. What a beautiful way to begin, too. And where did it take you from there? Once that was created, you, you obviously continued your pursuits because uh, you're a brilliant you know, documentarian and BBC producer. How did all of that world come your way? Well, I was, also, I was active at that time, but I decided I, I, was, I was in some amazing productions with some fantastic directors whom I still know at Oxford. Um, but I decided I preferred being like a conductor, conducting the whole thing. I don't see director as something where you um, say, you must do this, you must do that. It's a collaborator, like a conductor is with the orchestra. Um, so um, I became a director at Oxford. I started, you had the freedom. You just had to persuade someone to let you do it. And I was quite good at persuading someone to let me do it. Um, and so I began, my first production had a cast of 36 people including some people who are now very famous. Um, it was the Oz trial. It was based on a trial that was going on about a children's magazine. Um, and we had all the people out who'd been written about it, talked about it to, I, I, I had a sort of procession before the show. I took the whole of Oxford with me and Oxfordshire. Um, we marched through the town, we sang. Then we all came in to the theater, saw the production, um, and then we had a QA and a afterwards with some of the most, the people who had been involved in that trial, um, very famous people like Germaine Greer and many others. Um, and six of them each night after the show would have a little debate. Um, and it was more than just coming to a play. I've always wanted, I've always seen theatre as more than just coming to a play. It's about the people who are involved in it. And they need not just to be on that stage, I believe, um, and they have to do a very good job on the stage to earn it, but they need to actually relate to the audience in the way you relate to your audience, you know? And you build up a kind of family with the audience. And that's really what I enjoy most um, about theatre, that it's not just putting on a play, it's much more than that. And I am still friends with the original actors I directed, um, and... Um, but the other thing is, I found it really very, very important that my life was outside the theatre and I could bring other things to the theatre. So my best friend it, it still is a mountaineer, um, all, all different kinds of qualities that they could teach me and I could bring into the theatre to make it broader than just what that particular play was about. I've always believed that. That's that's really a wonderful way to look at everything. And um, talk about some of these documentaries that you've had. And I've had an opportunity to work on several documentaries. Um, uh, some of them I've narrated because I do voiceover. Uh, some of them I've hosted. Some of them I've hosted, executive produced, edited. Uh, we just actually won a couple of telly awards for a documentary that we just did last year where we spotlighted a, a renowned visual artist who is in California. And uh, documentaries are really fascinating because as you're telling the story about whatever the person or the topic or the theme is, you're learning so much about the experience and about life. You really, I mean, I remember in, in working on that documentary last year, I felt such an overwhelming responsibility to get her story right. She's 91 years old and she's been doing this ever since she was two years old with crayons. And now she's a renowned, she's in the Smithsonian, she's a renowned visual artist. And she has a beautiful, you know, uh, studio attached to her home in Burbank, California. 
And as we were working on it, as she and I developed our relationship, uh, which I think is very important to develop a relationship, not just come in with a crew and okay, what's what, and that's it. Develop this relationship, which we did, and we still have become, you know, we stayed friends since we did this last year. Um, I felt this this nightly burden of really making sure everything from the music to the camera angles to the lighting to the textures of the dissolves to uh, meaning dissolve from one for the audience dissolving from one um, shot or visualization to another uh, the different fades uh, as well as the content the conversation and what we used in it and I felt just an overwhelm to make sure self-induced overwhelm to make sure that her story was told intelligently, respectfully, lovingly, impactfully, which obviously resulted in those awards, which we really appreciate. But do you get that too when you're working on a documentary, not just to get the facts right, but sometimes it can be very consuming, but in a really beautiful and brilliant way? I love documentaries. In many ways, I love them for doing plays. Um, I'll, I'll just <laughs> give you an example. My degree was in Russian. So um, I made quite a lot of documentaries, either in Russia or about Russian things. And once I was working with a brilliant filmmaker called Roger Grave, right at the start of my documentary career. And we were in Russia, it was very snowy, and he, we had to go right out in the country um, to capture um, a particular area where the great director Stanislavski had worked and lived. Um, and the snow was perfect. Nobody had walked there. Um, it was absolutely untouched. And we did the first little um, bit of the documentary. Um, and then I noticed that someone had dropped something the other side of where we were working. And being very conscientious, I thought, I'd better go and pick it up because I was helping Roger. I ran across this virgin snow and everybody screamed because I put footmarks in the snow. And we had to take more than one take. <laughs> and I had spoiled this pristine snow. And I suddenly realized that actually you have what you're saying, you have to be so careful and accurate and truthful in making documentaries. That was a real lesson I learned. But um, also, I just love the fact that we have the freedom, or I have the freedom and you have the freedom to choose the subject you want to document. Um, what you're saying about how you need to take care of the people, so, so important, especially in the Russia, when I was first making documentaries, when it was very difficult for people and they were having to stand out in the freezing cold just to sell matches or something, posh people, you know, to earn money. So um, I love the authenticity of documentaries. I love the fact you always have to take, you have to make sure you're filming or recording more than you know you'll need, so much more, because you can't go back generally, you know? Um, I love the fact um, also that you don't have all the egos of actors to deal with, <laughs> although I love actors, I really do, I love working with actors, but you know what I mean, suddenly there is something that is um, about more than personality, it's about place, it's about all sorts of other things. Because the people you're talking to are generally talking about their lives and their experiences. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. playing a role of somebody else recreating it. They're talking about their moments and their accomplishments and the things they've been through in their lives with the documentary, right? Absolutely. And beautiful things like I remember one guy who'd come back from Siberia where he'd been sent um, and he'd made friends with a crow and he kept that crow bird on his balcony and he was so tender to this crow, you know, I'm never, there are things you never forget when you're making documentaries, moments, which you probably know, which um, are just seared into your mind. Um, I love the fact that it's real, um, that you have all this material, and then you sit in a place and you're going through it and you think, how do I make the story? You know what, you, before you go, you have to know what you want to get into the story, but how do I make all this amazing material become the story? And I think both theatre, film, or not just both, everything, theatre, film, documentaries, 
plays, they're all about telling a story. You're telling a story now, I'm telling a story, you know? And right from childhood, the first thing we learn is to listen to stories. It's what we need, particularly in times like this. What are some of the projects that you've worked on as a director, as a producer, uh, maybe wearing both hats at the same time, that really stand out for you, that you're most proud of, the ones that really you look back at them and you're like, boy, that was such a joy to work on that. And, and whether it received you know, worldwide acclaim or accolades, uh, when we got the awards, uh, those, those several telly awards for that documentary last year, that was just like a feather in the cap. We didn't do it for awards. We did it for the love of the project, but it just solidified that the folks that were judging internationally this documentary that we hosted and produced with the crew um, got what the depth, the feeling, the warmth, because again, it was a feature on an individual's life. So I felt very responsible for really carefully and lovingly tell her life and celebrate her artwork and all that she's about. She's a very uh, spiritual woman as well, and she feels she's a conduit. You know, all the brilliant art is uh, coming from something above, you know, like a divine. So she's very, very deep, and it was a very deep situation. And I felt as though, um, you know, there was so much to share in reference to that. So for you, when you look, whether accolades came or not, what are some of those projects that really stood out and stand out for you, Fania? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> so many, right? Yeah, I, 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 because you enter into each one that you do so much. I suppose um, Brothers Karamazov, which we turned into a play, the Dostoevsky novel, we turned that into the most amazing play with Alan Rickman playing Ivan. Um, it was the beginning of my relationship with Alan Rickman, who remained a friend throughout his life as long as he lived. Um, and I still really miss him. Um, he, this brings up something. I'm going to just veer off slightly because people always are amazed when I work with what, people who are known as difficult actors. Why do you work with such difficult actors, people who are so difficult? And I know generally, if they're very, very talented, it's simply because they are idealists. They want to get it right. They want to know that they're on the right path, but they're not gonna ask you because they're usually too proud. Um, but working with Alan was a real lesson and we did become firm friends and we stayed friends right until his death, um, sadly lamented. So Brothers Karamazov, this huge novel, my playwright husband- And there Richard, he is now, there's Alan. Oh, oh bless him. Um, he turned this vast novel into a play of four actors, just the four brothers. And it had a completely authentic meaning. It was so wonderful to work with four brilliant actors, to rehearse with them. Whenever they got a bit naughty, I we, re we rehearsed in Brighton College and there's a swimming pool there. So whenever they got a bit naughty, I'd throw them in the pool to make them do Esther Williams swimming routines. Um, but, it was fantastic, and I learned a lot. Um, then again, um, working in the vast Albert Hall in London was probably the largest venue I've ever worked in. Um, and I did a contemporary opera there, um, and um, playing, just building something for such a massive audience in such a famous place was a completely other thing. You had to make sure you weren't overawed by it. You, I can remember having the actors, I, I didn't just use the stage. I put one of the singers right up the top with the top, top upper circle. And he had three minutes to get right the way down the Albert Hall, talking all the while <laughs> to get onto the stage. And that was quite a moment. That is moments in, in productions that I remember. And perhaps the very first play I directed, which we called Satan's Ball, um, it was, what, what was it based on, Richard? Master and Margarita. Oh, yeah. uh, Bulgakov's um, incredible novel called Master and Margarita. We called it Satan's Ball because it's about Satan and Jesus. And 
it's the most beautiful novel. And we turned it into a huge play um, with dancing, singing. <coughs> um, and I'm still in touch with a leading lady from that who lives in Malaysia. She was the award-winning Malaysian. She was Miss Malaysia, in fact. So beautiful and with such a voice. And she had to, um, there was a moment when she had to actually strip and walk uh, and be rid of everything, including all clothes. She had to be rid of everything and sing the most beautiful song as she walked up an incredible number of stairs to the top of the theatre. Um, that's a moment I'll never forget. But then the smaller ones, some of the one person shows that I've directed because you're working so intimately with another actor or actress. Um, you, can, you can rehearse when you want then. You can suit your times just to one other person. So you can rehearse at the best times. You can spend as long as you want. You're not limited. Uh, I mean, yes, you give them breaks. Of course you do. But um, you really get to know an actor that way. Absolutely. Um, Yes, and oh, it's really hard to think. I love everything I do, actually. We're currently doing a trilogy about insects. And we've done the first one already in the Brighton Festival, Festival and we took it to the Venice Biennale. What's the name of it? It's called Moz, exclamation mark, because it's about mosquitoes. Not a much-loved insect, but everybody fell in love with my actor, who played that part and we took it all over the world and um, that was that was great fun so that was Moz the first one we were about to do the second one which is about bees and that's called exit the queen she's the bees knees look he's got the t-shirt <laughs> that's my husband Richard Crane he wrote it or he's writing it um, and we were about to Love it. <laughs> right, that's what it made. And of course, we couldn't do it. So it's now got firm dates for next May for the next Brighton Festival. So hopefully we'll do that. And then the third one, we're trying to make people learn not necessarily about the insects they love. So we may do locusts because of the effect they have on our world. You know, we're not sure what the third one's going to be. That's Mars. That is one. We have that, and we have a little clip here we're going to uh, share with the audience. So uh, give it a little bit of an intro so people know what we're going to see with this particular clip, because this is one of the latest works. Can I ask my husband to do that intro? Sure, absolutely. He wrote it and he acted it. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they oh, yeah, are, yeah. Um, the, yeah, it's a male mosquito, which not many people know about. The male mosquito is completely harmless. It's only the female that takes your blood. And she doesn't take your blood because she's vicious. She takes your blood because she needs it for her children. She needs it for as protein for her eggs. So the male mosquito has come along tonight to ask you to be ready when my lady wife comes to ask for the blood, um, asking you to donate your blood for my children. Um, he has to persuade the audience that this is going to be a good thing. He also tells them that um, it's the diseases are nothing to do with the mosquito. The mosquito is just simply carrying diseases from one diseased host to another diseased host. So he's got a kind of... Um, charm to him in a way, but he also learns a lot. It all happens within one week because he only lives for one week. Uh, a mosquito, a male mosquito will die after say about seven or eight days. But in that time, he says one thing he has to do and that is mate. He has to find his mate, spend all night with her in the air and then, um, then he's done it. <laughs> and then, then that's the end of his life. Um, but what a life. Um, and so, it's very funny as well as quite tragic, really. Like you, we believe that entertainment should be, I mean, theatre and film and all this should really be entertaining, however serious. Absolutely. Well, what he just described sounds like prom night at high school. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Well, he grows up through the week. The, the plays in three parts. The first part is on Monday evening when he's aged about 12. And he's just getting used to the idea of going out with the lads tonight to see what he can find. 
Um, then the, halfway through the week, he's about 35. He's kind of mm, just on the cusp of kind of not being quite as good as he was. And then <laughs> finally, he's aged about 85, and that's the at the end of it. But that all takes place in one week. Let's see the um, extract. Yeah. All right. Let's yeah. take a look at the excerpt and enjoy, and then we will be back in just a second to chat more with our special guests. Moz, a week in the life of an undercover mosquito. How many of you can claim to have ovum, larva, pupa, imago on your life's journey planner? How many of you have spent three days as an egg on a raft in a paint can, then a week as a wiggler, head down in a puddle of piss, shuffling off one mortal coil after another till you pop up as a pupa? Our mosquito has one aim in life, and that is to mate. However, the excitement of finding perhaps a slightly older mosquito who's been around a bit uh, for his first sexual experience permeates the play. I know somewhere in the misty marshlands of our twilight world, there is a nymph-like beauty with six long slim legs and gossamer wings who is thinking the same thoughts. Like me, she is one day old. Like me, she is practicing flight, working up to 500 BPS and carving a cello concerto on her wings. The play asks a question. Who is the most dangerous creature on Earth? Yellow fever, dengue fever, equine and every other encephalitis, chikungunya, elephantiasis, zika. And that's just us. The Aedes aegypti. Malaria, we leave to our cousin Anopheles of Africa. Who is responsible for all the damage we're doing to the planet? But think again, how many billions upon billions upon billions are there of us? And how many more trillions and zillions will there be as the world gets warmer, as our eggs hatch quicker, as our lives last longer? because the weather is getting more scorching by the day due to nothing we did. We didn't poison the air. We didn't cut down the jungles. We didn't swamp the seas. We are not the cause. And we are only incidentally the means. We draw pathogens from a sick host as a bee draws pollen. And we pollinate pathogens into the next host in our analgesic anticoagulant saliva. I hope the audience will find this play authentic because a lot of research was done with entomologists in various universities. It was conceived at the height of the Zika virus. But it's not just about the Zika mosquito. What you'll find is very true scientific facts, but presented in a really entertaining way. Richard presents you simply with words, a wonderful flow of words, not a single stage direction, not a single piece of punctuation. And out of that, one's imagination as a director can soar. Bug bites on beach bums and buboes on bimbos, gangrenous tubers and testes of jumbos, blood sucking jiggers and flesh eating flies. These are the poisons that give me a rise. The fact that Moz has been such an unexpected hit with sell out shows, five star reviews, and has become the coolest play in town, it is now ready to travel the world. The play asks a question, who is the most dangerous creature on Earth? Who is responsible for all the damage we're doing to the planet? Is it the mosquito or is it you? We can't help it. We don't know what we're spreading and it doesn't harm us. It doesn't poison our eggs. It doesn't damage our kids. And if in the end we wipe out humanity, who's complaining? Who inherits the earth? Not one of the audience got bitten. <laughs> that is, <laughs> everybody loves it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Very well uh, prepared and brilliantly done with that twist of humor, which is terrific. And the reaction has been amazing, huh? It really has. Um, 
I've, I've also built up a reputation, I don't know why. Wherever I seem to go, I, oh, wherever I seem to go, um, I'm followed by a revolution. We took things to Romania. We took Vlad the Impaler to Romania, which was about Romania, with John Hurt. And um, well, I redirected it with Romanian actors. Um, and we took Brothers Karamazov as well there. And um, revolution followed. <laughs> <laughs> that's it have you ever thought of running for office perhaps <laughs> no way <laughs> there's another clip we have here maybe you can uh intro it for us vlad the impaler that's the one yes yes that's the one yeah, yeah. he's I mean, very good in we were in Romania in 1989 we were actually there as um uh British counselor. The, uh, the ever the director is directing you to squat down. She's a brilliant director. <laughs> I've got him on his yeah, knees. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were there to look at what theatre was like under the dictator Ceausescu in his last days, but nobody knew it was his last days at that time. And so and one of the plays we saw was this play by a playwright called Marin Sorescu called Vlad the Impaler, which was about um, the... Uh, historic hero of Romania, um, Vlad, who wasn't Dracula, he was actually the savior of his country, but he was also very brutal and he had some very, very nasty habits <laughs> of, of what he did to people uh, when he caught them being um, mis misbehaving, basically. And so we, we got to know the author of this play. Uh, we got his agreement that we could um, uh, translate it into English reduce it and turn it into a radio play and perform it on, on BBC Radio. And we did that with the actor John Hurt playing Vlad himself. Um, we then took it from there and put it back on the stage and we did it in Glasgow and then in Brighton. Um, so it had quite a journey, that play. Um, yeah. A very powerful message because um, it's not just about a villain. It's about someone who is in a very tight spot. He was in Romania at the time when the Turks were coming from the south and the Hungarians were coming from the north and Romania was about to be squashed. And so um, Vlad had the task of gingering up his country into uh, a, a country that could resist on both fronts. <laughs> he failed, but in failing, he became his country's founding father. And John Hurt, as an actor goes, has the most incredible vocal range. I mean, it's the most beautiful, it was the most beautiful voice to listen to. Amazing actor. And there's a photo of John Hurt right there that you yeah. sent along. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We'll take a look at that clip now and uh, come back and chat some more. Thank you. Sandwiched, crushed from south and north till the living meat must break out. This will be no picnic, so sharpen your steak impaler. Let it hold its ground. They whisper the name behind my back, but I impale them quite openly. Vlad the Impaler. When we were working at the National Theatre in Romania, we met their noble nominee, Marin Sorescu. His play was a huge hit in the latter days of Ceausescu and it showed the power of theatre to help bring down a dictatorship. He gave us his script to adapt as a radio play starring John Hurt. This epic play is now returning to the theatre as a chamber piece for three actors with music. I'm Fania Williams, director. And I'm Richard Crane, playwright. We hold the record of nine Edinburgh Fringe First Awards. Plus many other awards, including Best Theatre Performance, Brighton Festival. Vlad the Impaler has had a mixed press from history. 
His hardline social policy, mass impalings, burnings, fanned by horror stories from the new printing presses, caught the imagination of Western Europe and helped create the Vlad Dracula legend. It's never been more important to get inside the skin of a monster. It's the same struggle and world crisis today. Legend has it that Vlad used to like to take his lunch with his impalees and chat to them. So we've chosen to open the play at Oran Moor, which is Glasgow's renowned lunchtime theatre known as a play, a pie and a pint. Then bring it to the Brighton Festival Fringe, also at lunchtime, to the brand new Rialto Theatre, a Gothic play for a Gothic building. A cast of just three, a small portable set, a genre that will attract a broad, diverse audience and a company with an exciting track record of innovative theatre awaits your invitation. Then Vlad and his impalees will be ready to travel the world with a unique production that will deconstruct one of the most urgent contemporary discourses affecting our world today. Be very afraid, a thoroughly modern monster is offering to put down his stake at a very Tell us about the Brighton Theatre itself so people really understand what it is that you do. It's really extraordinary, some of the works that come out of the Brighton Theatre itself. Well, I was just thinking after seeing that, we do have fun. But um, <laughs> Brighton Theatre is not based in a building. We chose that particularly because one of our main interests is going to wonderful spaces and turning them into appropriate places for whatever work we might be doing. Um, yeah, we started off um, in Brighton um, on the beach, of course, because we're in Brighton by the sea and there's a beach, and we did Mutiny on the Bounty. And I've never- And you know, there was a play here in the States called Brighton Beach Memoirs. Had you heard that? Right. Yes, I have. Broadway play, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've got to get together somehow. <laughs> It's Neil Simon, isn't it? I think. I think it is. Yeah. Um, so we did Mutiny on the Bounty um, on the beach with a local school, um, wonderful children, several of whom at the time were actually on bail because it was a very difficult school with, uh, catering for difficult children. And they were so thrilled to have something that occupied their mind and their heart and everything. And um, I encouraged them. They used to go out fishing in their lunch hours. Um, and um, it was an amazing um, experience. The production was bought by David Essex. I don't know if he's known in um, America, but very, very famous pop star in England, in the UK. Um, and he bought it to do in London. It was down at the Piccadilly Theatre. Um, and Richard, did you want to talk any more about it? Just yeah, I briefly? mean, it had quite a journey, like a lot of plays, actually, it has a kind of lifetime. It starts off as one thing. Got you on your knees again, I'm directing you. <laughs> um, um, it was quite a surprise, but in those days, it does seem that things could uh, segue into a different sort of level of performance. Um, uh, I'd done a, a television play and David Essex's manager saw that and wanted to know if there was something I had for him and he didn't want a musical, you know, and I said, well, I haven't got anything except I'm just working on a musical at the moment on Mutiny on the Bounty. And suddenly David got really interested in being Fletcher Christian. He really wanted to do the Marlon Brando. So um, uh, we got together and we rewrote the play. He re rewrote the music. We built a ship and uh, we set sail. You have a very long left arm, Fania. <laughs> You're roping him in like with a cane on, like they do on stage. <laughs> so make sure he doesn't roam out of the camera lens, right? <laughs> 45 years of marriage, right? Congratulations. 45 yeah. years. Yes. So, yeah, that, that's the story of that one. I mean, it was a rocky ride. You know, we, you can't do a show about a mutiny without a mutiny. So um, we had a lot of... Um, I don't know where I am. Yeah. <laughs> there okay. you go. Yeah, let's go like this. That's probably yeah. There you go. <laughs> Shall we start again? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. 
So that, I mean, that's the story of that one. But then we moved on to another thing. How far back do you want to go, dearly beloved? <laughs> <laughs> We have another, you guys are doing something really cool called the Lockdown Sessions. And we have one with Sam, Sam yeah. Crane, the son, right? Our, and our son, our youngest. Tell and us about the Lockdown Sessions and, and what that is all about. Well, when everybody said there's no more theater, we thought that cannot be, we won't allow it. So I got together with some of our favorite actors and um, I said, look, why don't we just do some extracts from Richard's plays um, and just record them? Um, and obviously we can't necessarily be together, but you put your ideas in, pass them by me. And if I like them, I'll say to you, you go and record it. So Sam Crane, our youngest son, is an actor, very well known actor in England. And he also came to Broadway. He played opposite Mark Rylance in Farinelli and the King. He played Farinelli and Mark Rylance played the King um, fairly recently. And um, he actually, just before lockdown, he was about to become a big star in London in a new play. And that they were actually in rehearsal. That all finished. But anyway, so I said to him, would you like to do one of them, um, one of the extracts? And he, because the first line was about running through fields, he went out. And I, I wouldn't have directed the whole play in a field, but he actually did it running through fields. And it's wonderful. It really works. So that's one you're going to show. Um, the others, I came across a young 16-year-old girl who's desperate to go into the theatre. Now, lots of 16-year-old girls are desperate to go into the theatre. So I had to sort of find out if she had any talent. And so I gave her one of these to do, and she turned out to be wonderful. Um, and then... The other, the third one, has the son of another really famous actor called, a uh, British actor called Frank Finlay. Um, his name is Daniel Finlay. Um, and he, what did you say, Richard? He played um, Captain Bly. Yeah, Frank yeah. Finlay played Captain Bly in, <laughs> in the original Mutiny on the Bounty film. No. And no, theatre, theatre, no. ooh. <laughs> You see, we are able to argue as well as agree on things. That's how our marriage is. The perfect marriage, isn't it? <laughs> so we have these three lovely extracts with these actors, and you're going to show the one with our son. I'm very pleased because then he won't get at me for not showing him. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, here is Sam Crane, and it's the plague. <laughs> here we go. Enjoy, and we'll be right back. We have a lot more to show you. I walked through the fields one fair July morning. There were blooms by the road and the river ran clear. But none did I spy, no farmer's boy calling, no maid in the meadow, no sign of life here. And I went past the church that was full every Sunday and the school that once rang with singing and play. And both were dead silent, the windows all boarded, the children and teachers had all gone away. A dreary and desolate silence descended, a sighing I heard, I raised my dull head, saw a cart down the street had stopped by a door, for a woman and baby and young man dead. And I came to a field that fair July morning where a pit was dug out some 20 feet wide and they stopped and they took the man, woman and baby, skin and bones without names and tipped them inside. And I cried to the skies, why oh, curse your creation with grieving and tears, the torments of hell. But no one was grieving. No neighbours, no mourners. The angel of death had killed them as well. Mm, 
Really, really incredible, huh? Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Very proud of moving that. He's not, I was very lucky because of lockdown because he just missed out on having started the rehearsals and this big show that was coming off. So I could actually ask him. I mean, I used to work with him quite a bit when I was starting and he was starting, but now he's he's always in work. He's very, very much wanted. So it was fantastic to have this opportunity to work with him again, really, really, and to work on something that he did so movingly. Absolutely. Now we have another one here too. Um... And this one is, is it Tatiana? Letter? My 16-year-old um, Discovery. She's going to be big, this girl. <laughs> it's from Eugene Onegin. Another um, piece by Pushkin, but rewritten by the man who will not come into camera view behind me. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> 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 very, very common because she's absolutely crazy about him, but he doesn't want to know. And then much later on in their life, he suddenly realized that actually he's really crazy about her, but then it's too late um, because she's already married. So it's terribly, terribly tragic. It's about mistimed love and um, awful tragedies come into it as well. George Connolly, I've just seen him up. Really? He was one of our best friends in New York. We haven't seen him for years. Oh. He's watching the show uh Jim Masters TV on YouTube, George. Sam Crane was wonderful. He was Savior in New York. Yeah. My assistant. We were doing Brothers of Charmat up in New York. Oh. We had all of them. Everybody watches the Jim Masters show. <laughs> Bruce is in California, proud to listen to their British accents. Hashtag London Heritage. And awesome tearjerker, as far as what we just saw with Sam. Uh, wonderful Sam, great acting. Uh, June, Sam was amazing. I feel like I'm at home with all of you. This is cool. And across the water there, she does the Irish slancha. <laughs> one big happy family here. We're going to take a look at this one, and then we'll come back and we'll chat a little bit more. Great night here on the Gym Masters uh, show live with our illustrious guests from beautiful Brighton, England on the James Masters show. <laughs> That's right. That's what you would say, Masters, right? We would say Masters. J James Masters. So James sure. Masters. We'll be Yorkshire, we'll be what would it be in Yorkshire? James Masters. You'd be James Masters. James Masters. Yeah. <laughs> and in New York, they'd say Masters. <laughs> That's funny. All right, here's that clip, and all of us will be back in just a second. I know it's not a lady's place to write to a gentleman like this. I know it's not a lady's place to write to a gentleman at all. She must wait and fret and panic, bite her nails and take a tonic, sit and groan and weep and sigh and chip the heavy hours away. Well, I've waited, and I've fretted, panicked, groaned, and wept, and sighed, and every night lain wide awake for two months. Ever since your visit, I've been hammering my head against an iron press in bed. Why did you come? If you'd stayed away, my life would have gone on, dull and bleak. 
that's bearable because I wouldn't need to hope. I wouldn't know what I was missing. I'd continue fantasising, bathing in romantic streams of novels, magazines and dreams while my family packaged me into an early womanhood led to markets dumb and good I'd be exhibited and my teeth hair skin eyes, height, weight, shape, size intelligence and disposition special peculiarities pedigree and breeding stock would all be fully scrutinised and maybe I'd secure a mate of suitably highborn estate of middle or advancing years who'd lead me down the aisle in tears invade my body with a grunt and put himself out to grass when he had sired sufficient family and I'd continue quite content with daily chores and social calls good works and mother craft and balls That's not the life for me. That's why I'm writing to you. Can't you see that you and I were meant to be? A long time ago, before you ever actually came to see us, I dreamed about you. I knew your face your voice, your manner, how you entered a room, and how you smiled, and how you stood, and how you sat, and yawned at superficial chat, and fidgeted like a, like an angry child. Everything was in the dream. I even knew your name. And every dream was one step closer. First we were tongue-tied and gauche. Then we found a sense of humour. And by accident, we touched. And kissed and found we were tongue-tied again. But since you came to see us, since you entered the room and smiled and sat and yawned and went, those dreams have gone. And I lie in bed terrified it's all a plot to send me mad. I'm not going to read the set through. I'll seal it, send it, let it come flapping through your letterbox for you to stack on the pile of all the other dumb and reckless rubbish you receive each week from girls who are too sick with love to speak. You can do as you like. It's up to you. I've laid my bleeding heart bare on a plate. You can ignore it, or tear it in two, or pity, or mock its poor, pathetic state. Alternatively, 
you might mount your fiery charger white and gallop through the howling night and hear my choked and feeble call and scale the granite castle wall and break the iron chain and ball and then, oh ecstasy of bliss, embrace and wake me with a kiss. Very moving, very beautiful. Mm. And we're getting a lot of comments coming in. Such a brilliant actress and interpretation there as well, huh? Yes, she's going places, that girl. And it's beautifully written by this man who won't come into the camera. Richard, Richard Crane? Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he's flying out of the picture like a crane would. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh. No, she's gorgeous. She's absolutely fantastic. What is her name again? So people can look out for her. Ava Pavla Ruffel. She may change her name. <laughs> I don't know, but it's a beautiful oh, name. A name. And that was done with no training. She's never been trained. Really? So yeah. it's a it's a natural gift. Yeah. It's a natural automatic. I spend a lot more time with her than I did with the other two because she needed it, but. A lot of the ideas are her own, you know? She's lovely. We've had quite a few Tatianas in the, sh in the show, which we did. Um, but she is the most innocent. She's the, she's the one who actually got it um, first time around, you know, as if she'd never, ever been in that situation before. Amazing comments coming in from around the world. Mary Bishop says, what a great actress, bravo. Oh, Jennifer Barry says, good magical. Merlin in Canada, what an amazing actress. Juanita in South Africa, wow, love her. Christine in North Carolina, USA. These are really fascinating clips. I like your detailed explanations and stories too. You two have cute interactions during the storytelling. <laughs> She's, yeah, she steps on his foot and then he lowers. <laughs> uh, lovely actress. Clap, clap, clap. Some beautiful, beautiful words. And we do have the other clip, um, which is from that series of the lockdown uh, Pushkin, uh, this one here. So do you want to uh, sort of intro this particular one, this other one? Yes, I mean, this is another amazing actor, son of one of our great British actors, as I said, Frank Finlay. Um, what do you want to say, Richard, about well, it? Um, it? This is called The Prophet, <laughs> and it's what Pushkin wrote. Could you come down? Um, uh, Pushkin was in lockdown when he wrote this, you know. He was in internal exile because he'd fallen out with the Tsar. He was actually... Um, a, a kind of very controversial revolutionary poet and the revolutionaries had his poems in their pockets. He was like Bob Dylan of his day. Um, and anyway, the, the uh, Tsar sent him off to his country place and told him not to come out for quite a long time. So he was un in lockdown. So while he was in lockdown, he wrote um, several classic works. And um, one of them was a poem called The Prophet where he actually has a, uh, an epiphany on the road uh, of what he's got to do in the world. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After uh, the illustrious uh, introduction, Phineas is, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Cue, cue the tape, right? <laughs> and here we go. Here is that clip. Another brilliant one, and we will come back with uh, some more right after this. Enjoy this, everybody. Hope you're having a good time with us tonight and our special guests on the Gym Master Show Live. Over a dark, deserted waste, 
I dragged my past and thirsty soul, and where ways crossed, a seraph stood, six winged and shining. Fingers soft as dreams he laid across my eyes, whose lids flew eagle wide. He touched my ears, which filled with pealing bells and roaring skies, swift angel wings, and monsters moving beneath the wave, seeds in earth bursting fruit in vines. And down he bowed and touched my lips and took my lying and languid tongue and tore it out. His blooded hand thrust in with darting sting, the tongue of a serpent wise. With sword he cleft my breast. Cut free my quivering heart and pressed in place all fiery bright, a red hot coal. I lay as dead. And then the voice of God spake unto me Arise, prophet. Hark, behold, O a land and sea, my will be heard. Go burn men's hearts with the word. Mm. I tell you, a very, very powerful performance there, too, huh? <laughs> Daniel actually runs a training school in Brighton, a very well-known training school called ACT, A-C-T, and he trains a lot of people who become famous later on, um, but he's a wonderful actor. And they're so. bucking the long lockdown trend uh, by building a new theatre. When At the time when nobody's building theatres or doing anything in theatres, they're actually building a theatre. So they're actually going to go on doing live theatre somehow or other. Like that's their plan. And so are we. Mm. So it's not it's not <laughs> quite so gloomy. You know? <laughs> and life will go on. Absolutely. Absolutely. We yeah. have some uh, beautiful photos here, too, that we wanted to share. Maybe uh, you can do some narration for them. Here's a great one here. Um, oh, that's me with my first husband, Michael Williams. And our two daughters, the one on Michael's lap is Sabra. She is an actress in L.A. Um, for many years, she was with um, Tim Robbins' Actors Gang. She now runs something called Creative Acts. Um, do Google it because it's very, very interesting. I mean, she's a big girl now. <laughs> she's nearly, she's catching me up in age. <laughs> I would hope so with those credentials, huh? <laughs> And the other tiny one actually lives in Brighton at the moment. That's Tiona. And she works in, she was an actress. She appeared in the West End of London um, in The Importance of Being Earnest. Uh, she now works in conflict and post conflict regions. And she's just got a new job with the United Nations. And in about two weeks' time, she's off to the Congo. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Very talented and accomplished family. Uh, Mary Bishop, who's our viewer of the week, she has a suggestion for Richard. Pull up a chair. <laughs> they also love his Let It Be uh, shirt that he's wearing too. Uh, beautiful family. Some really, really nice comments. And here's another one. This was from Vlad the Impaler. Oh, no. oh, yes, that is Jack Clapp and Anna Maria Nabira on the right. Um, what's his name? And what's his name on Scottish the left? Uh, Harry <laughs> Robertson, Ian Robertson. Ian Robertson, yeah. yes. Um, that was a fun show. Oh, that's oh. me. That's me, heavily pregnant with one of us. That's have, you? Yeah. That's me. We have two sons, Richard and I. I was heavily pregnant with the first son. It was at the Edinburgh Festival. And I was doing a piece called The Passion Considered as an Uphill Bicycle Race by a wonderful French writer called Alfred Jarry. 
it's mad. I mean, we do like to have fun. It's very serious, but it's also mad. She crazy, wasn't going anyway. It's an exercise bike. No, it wasn't because I was very <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> and it won an award. Um, and as you described it, heavily pregnant, you said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that was Leo's first appearance on the stage. On the stage, inside my tummy. Yeah. Yes. He's now an artist. There's yeah. dear darling Alan again. Oh, how I miss him. Oh. Mm. Mm. Ah, now that is very interesting. That is Ian Dury, who of the Blockheads, remember of, Ian Dury um, and the Blockheads, the blockheads of, um, pop singer <laughs> who I turned one. into one flat. He was a one flatter with um, one of the many British actresses who have three names. She's Shirley, Shirley Ann Field, <laughs> a very famous actress. And putting the two of them together, you couldn't have had two more unlikely people together. Ian is down to earth, cockney, East End, no nonsense person. Shirley Anfield is a beautiful actress, quite posh. From the north. From the north of England, but um, very, very English. Um, uh, she has a, 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 a what, what do we call PR accent. Um, they were wonderful to work. I didn't even think they'd say hello to each other. They were so different. <laughs> and they worked together magnificently. Those are the kind of risks I like to take. Actually, you know, everyone said you cannot have Shirley Ann Field with Ian Jury, and we did. <laughs> and there's my darling John Hurt. Um, now he's one of what they call difficult actors. He was. Um, <clears throat> I went to record something in Ireland, and the head of um, RTE, the Irish um, Broadcasting, um, was so determined. He loved John Hurt. He wanted to work with him, so he came into my rehearsals. John was deciding to be very, very difficult. So I did what I always do with John. Um, I decided after five minutes, we'll go and have coffee somewhere. Um, and <laughs> the head of RT just could not understand this. And he said, I don't think I can work with that man. I said, well, you'll be missing out because it's worth everything to work with him. And in the end, we had a wonderful piece that I recorded with him. Um, and we came back from Ireland, luckily still friends, um, and remained friends throughout his life. And again, he's another one I miss. Mm. Ah, one of my youngsters. Go on, Richard. Oh, this, is, um, <laughs> this is Harry Lloyd, um, who is one of the he's one of the Etonians. He he was at Eton um, with uh, with various people like um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Almost all the actors <laughs> of, of the nineties. Yes, yes, yes. But he's the one who actually isn't quite that doesn't come over quite so posh. That's him playing Nijinsky, Nijinsky the dancer, in a play that we did about Nijinsky and Diagolo. And we did it one of the times when we did it was um at the Victoria and Albert Museum as part of their exhibition on Diagolo. And that's um uh, Harry playing Diagolo. Who's now been in Nijinsky. American films. He's quite yeah. well known now. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a little story, if I have time to tell it, about that. Um, I oh, cast yeah. Harry opposite um, Finty Williams, who is the daughter of Judy Dench. So naturally, her mum came to see it at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And being very famous then, Judy Dench, they decided they would put her in the visitor's room um, yeah, while we were setting yeah. up. The visitor's room the, the fact that happened to be miles away from where we were doing it. Judy got very bored and decided she would come and find us. And she got lost it's in the eight, eight, miles eight miles of the V&A Museum. She got completely lost. We had to go up very, very late. Eventually, Judy Dent arrived in the audience, um, very cross. Um, but beautifully, um, well, well, regal, regal, cross yes. in a regal way. You know? Yes. When when Judy gets cross, then you, you it, the the whole room feels it. Um, um, and uh, we did manage to get the show started. And Finty and Harry were yeah. terrific together. And she was very complimentary and very nice no, at the no, party no, afterwards. She's, she's gorgeous. I yeah. absolutely love her. I wouldn't. Um, but um, it's a nice little story to go mm. with that play. You also she, you also rang uh, Finty up one day, and someone else answered the phone. And you said, um, "Could you take a message?" And that person took a message. And then later, you said to Finty, um, uh, "Who was that person who took the message? Was it your secretary?" And she said, "No, it was my mother." <laughs> <laughs> 
That, <laughs> that is, here's another, uh, another shot we have here. That's um, Alan again. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, ah, yeah, no, that's one. very interesting. Um, uh, we, 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 um, we went, we went. <laughs> I like the ah uh, and the M and the who, who should, who should take it? You or you or you flip. You want to flip a quarter? <laughs> no, no, no bones about it. He's making, making a, a bomb. bomb. He's making a bomb. And this is in a, in a, a downstairs bar theater um, with a very crowded audience. In Brighton. They come yeah. in and they're in the middle of a guy making a yeah. bomb. This is a, uh, this is a, a two hander play written by one of our former students from Brighton, from Bradford, uh, from uh, Sussex. Sussex, Sussex <laughs> University. Um, and this student, um, uh, 10 years previously, had been in the pub in this in Soho, the Admiral Duncan, which had been blown up by a nail bomber. It was a gay pub in the middle of Soho. And this was a homophobic attack um, to destroy as many people as possible. He survived that, but it affected him very badly in his head. And eventually he wrote a play about it. He wrote this play about two people. One of them is the bomber, and he gets actually in the head of the bomber. Why did the man do this? And the other one is a, a kind of therapist who comes to see him, who actually gradually, as the play evolves, turns out to have been in the pub that night. So gradually through the play, you get these two people kind of locked together in, the, in their own fate. Um, it's it's absolutely gripping as a piece and from the word go because when the audience come in and they see a guy lying across the bar making a bomb um they know they're not going to order their drink from him <laughs> that's dangerous you know <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, like all of Richard's plays, it has a lot I, of humour. I didn't humor. write this. I didn't write this. Oh, you didn't. No, no, I didn't write this. But some people, when they do go to a bar, they do go to get bombed. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and I'm forgetting what he wrote. Yeah, he yeah. didn't write this. No, 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 no. No, we we had we um, around the um, MA in dramatic writing, the Masters in dramatic writing at Sussex University for 12 years. And we had some lovely students, really, yeah. really exciting students. And he was one of them. Um, uh, uh, he, again, he was kind of difficult because, oh, wow. Oh, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. Look remember. at the way he's adoringly looking at you too. <laughs> Waiting for me to pull him down on his knee. <laughs> I think that was taken just before we went to south america yeah yeah because right. we we took the uh diaglyph nijinsky play to argentina and uruguay, uruguay. um because nijinsky married romola in argentina um much to the uh disappointments of diaglyph um in fact they broke up and they never uh spoke to each other again yeah, just well, I mean, we are so lucky. We would always determine that whatever work we did in theatre or in radio or in film would take us around the world. We just, I mean, the three things I particularly love have been taken away from me during COVID. One is theatre. They all begin with T. One is theatre, one is travel, and the third is togetherness. And teaching. And teaching, four yeah, films, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. And we don't have any of that now, really. And we're trying in our own way to restore. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's what I've been trying to do when I launched this series 21 weeks ago is to bring back the lost art of conversation. And that's what everybody has been telling me, that they feel when they watch this show every single night as we do it live nightly, they feel like they're, we're in each other's living rooms and it's comfortable. We have a lot of levity. We have good information, education, entertainment, a mix of a lot of different things on the show. But they feel very in touch with each other and the, sort of the warmth and the essence of the way the show is done and presented and the way it looks and feels. And some have said, including guests too, like some are performers who are a little down in the dumps because they're not getting to ch the chance to inter act with an audience and getting that feedback that um, when they come here, they're feeling a little lifted. They're left 
lifted and inspired to continue, which I, which to me is a blessing, you know, as a television and radio presenter and host and journalist and all this that I've done all these years to get that kind of feedback. It's really something. It's really amazing to me. You're doing the most amazing job. I mean, you also, I think you're definitely like us in lots of ways. When I was doing radio, I don't know if you do this, I always insisted on taking photos of the actors and putting them on, even though they're not seen, you know. And it was the first time they'd had photos of the actors all down the hallway, you know. Exactly, I, yeah, like a broadcasting scrapbook and things of that yeah. nature. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. on what was expected, really, you know. Here's ah. another, yeah, ah. here's another one. Tell us about this. Right, this is yeah. the brother of my first husband, who I think I said I was married to for eight years. He died when I was still in my 20s. Um, and this is his brother, who only recently died, who um, is a very famous artist, Aubrey Williams. Um, and um, my grandson, who is just 11, was, this is Sam's boy. This yeah. is Sam's son, yes, the son of my son, um, was asked to do a project for his school, for his homework, on any black British person. So he chose Aubrey, who is an artist, and he's written Aubrey's life history in just a few lines. It's wonderful, and shown some of his paintings. Um, Aubrey is represented, he had a room at the Tate at one time. Um, he's in all our most important galleries, um, and he's a, oh, he was a wonderful man. When my husband died, he was with me, and we didn't leave each other's side for two weeks that time, and he was, he's so entertaining. He can, he's spent time in the jungle in Guyana, or oh, here comes one of his paintings, which is gonna show you, um, my favorite painting, and Aubrey's favorite painting, actually, if you can, shall I, can you, yeah. There's me in the middle of it. Can you put it? Yeah. Can I direct you to put it straight? <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Um, and um, he's extra he's still having exhibitions even though he's got left us. Um, he lived in London and um, I learned so much from him as well as from my husband. They were wonderful brothers. Really, really amazing. It's an amazing family, the Williams family. Um, we are huge in America as well as in the UK. The ones that got off the boat in the UK because they were fed up, I think, with being on the boat, um, the others went to America. <laughs> um, and that's my family side as well. My, I'm half Romanian and half Russian. Um, and my mother's side is Russian. Yet you have an Irish or Scottish look. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people say that. It's Irish. A lot of people say that. Shinfania. Shin <laughs> There you go. Um, or or Riley. <laughs> Riley. I, that will stay with me. <laughs> that is amazing. When you look at this body of work and everything that you've done and continue to do, and obviously the two of you, I know, um, you know, we said Fania Williams, but Richard is so much a part of this. And people are saying, I guess we got two Lovities tonight for the price of one. So Richard's now a Lovity. You're a Lovity. Sam's a Lovity. The whole family, there's part of the Lovity Hall here at the Gym Masters show live. Can, can uh, I tell you one minute about Leo? Sure. Yes. Um, he's pretty exceptional too. He, um, well, I would say so, wouldn't I? I am biased. But... Um, he, do you want to talk about him? Yeah, he does? yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, he, I was, like the way she said she was going to say something and then she tossed it to you. You guys are funny. <laughs> he did a little bit of acting early on at school, but then when he saw everyone else was doing it, he decided to go into art. First of all, he did, went into ceramics and he, he really was very, very fond of his, his pottery teacher. And so he made lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pots, which he then gave to us. And we tried to get rid of them uh, to neighbours and things like that. Um, <laughs> then, um, after he left school, he went to Oxford University um, uh, to read classics. And then he went, um, after that, he went on, uh, on an internship to the Smithsonian in Washington uh, for a, a really, really useful uh, induction into the museum's business. 
and he came back to England. And before you know it, he was at the Victorian Albert Museum as um, uh, individual fundraiser, chief individual fundraiser. That means he would take someone out to breakfast and come away with a million pounds. But so what for, he does... For, for, for a new gallery. You know, well done. Um, now I'm going to talk. Oh yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> then what did he do? <laughs> <laughs> and he gave it all up. He became an animator. He makes the most incredible animated films. And then he got married, um, and the two of them have a company called Figuration. Figuration. Yeah. Um, and they do animation. They do uh, oh, but the latest yeah. thing that Leo does. I mean, he doesn't stop. He's now become a leading portrait painter. He makes the most amazing portrait paintings. Mm. I mean, he really incredible. Um, and we, we did have the most amazing gay marriage with him and his husband during Pride weekend in Brighton. When was it? About three <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Um, he keeps. He's a very quiet boy, but he keeps surprising us with extraordinary. I was going to say, you guys, obviously, in your careers and in your work and within your family, you're very, very blessed. And you've got a, you know, a lot of blessings bestowed upon you, but you've also created works that inspire and bring joy and blessing to, to so many others. Um, when you look at all this body of work and the team effort that it is, because everything always has a village wrapped around it of people that support the cause and support, you know, the vision and the dream. Uh, what are some of those inspirations that keep both of you still creating, still, you know, you could easily rest on your laurels and relax and say, you know, we've done good. We've done a lot of great work and, and just relax and, you know, have a nice time, but you're still creating, you're still impacting, you're still telling stories. What are those sources of inspiration for you? And when you look back at all of this incredible work thus far, how does that make you feel? I think the thing about laurels is that they don't last, they, they fade very quite quickly. So you're only as good as your last match, you know, as, as they say in football. Um, so you have to kind of, I mean, I think anybody in the theatre will understand that uh, your, your life is very precarious and never more so than now. You know, you, you, you feel any, any job that comes your way is, is a miracle. Um, especially if it's a good one, um, but then and what the excitement of it really is actually never knowing what you're going to be doing this time next year or even next month. Um, but it also, I think we create our own work. I mean, that's what we're good at, um, and it's because we have things to say. Never preaching. I never ever want to preach, but things that I want to share with other people. I love to make people laugh, to cry, um, to consider, to debate. I love it when the audience is fighting. Um, I, I've been in the audience, actually, when Alan Rickman wasn't acting and seen an audience fight, you know, um, over things. We, mm. I like to stir them, um, to make them want, we want to go places that we haven't been before, always, you know. Um, and it's... Age is only a number. It's experience that we've gained, which helps us go into the next experience, learn from what we've learned, but adding to that with something new, always. I think you only have one life. Um, it's very short, really. And there's just so much to share with people. Um, there's nothing better, as I said before, to make them laugh, to make them cry, and to make them think, you know? Um, and never, foisting something on someone like during lockdown when the children hadn't started school or anything i i was teaching an 11 year old and a nine year old discovering shakespeare i called it and we discovered it together i wasn't mm. telling them what shakespeare was you know we would read it together we would try and work out what it meant we'd imagine what the people would wear what they'd eat where they, what their beds were like that they slept in if they had mm. beds um, and it was, I got so much from children feeding in back into Shakespeare that I technically knew so well, you know. So it's that idea of always learning something new, always having something that you want to share. And we try and live a very broad life, don't yeah. we? I mean, you know, we try and, well, the, the thing I perhaps I miss most is travel. 
you know. Uh, on just, that, um, when we were traveling in Eastern Europe in the 1980s, just as everything seemed to be kind of collapsing, um, you, we noticed how important the theater was when we were looking around in Romania at the actual you know, the theatres which were going, because that was the only place you could gather anywhere because all gatherings were banned. Um, but the Ceausescu still sort of dismissed theatre as a kind of irrelevance. Uh, um, uh, and but so, they, they gathered <clears throat> in the freezing cold, there was no heating. Yeah. They would all have their coats on. and Everything you know. was censored, but you could do Shakespeare, you could do Hamlet without changing a single word and make it look as though it wasn't Denmark at all, it was actually Romania. And Claudius and Gertrude did bear a remarkable resemblance to two people that they love to hate, you know. So um, all, the, all that kind of subtlety came into it. And when we came, went back to Romania the next year, um, we met the actors who'd been actually in the front line. They'd been actually uh, at the barricades in the streets. And one actor came up to us and showed us his wounds, you know. And another one, I'd given him a script of a play and he gave it back <laughs> to me and it had a bullet hole through it. I mean, that's some criticism, you know. I've never had a bullet hole going right through a text. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then you had a playwright who was president of uh, Czechoslovakia, you know, the, the arts suddenly had a necessity to them. Really, really. And, and during everything we've been going through in this year mm -hmm. of 2020, mm -hmm. uh, the arts have been also been, uh, they've been a healing relief for a lot of people, whether they're watching nostalgic yeah. television shows, comedies, mm -hmm. films, listening to music, sculpting pottery out uh, here in the United States, one of the number one hobbies during all of this, believe it or not, has been gardening. And I'm a green thumb. I've always been a gardener. So going in the gardening, it's so therapeutic and colorful and, and just gardening has been so incredibly popular here. People want to get out of the house, get in touch with nature. We live here along the coast uh, in, in southern New England. And uh, is that the ripoff of the real England? New England? <laughs> The new, <laughs> they're in the old, and we're in the new. <laughs> but yet, but, we're but yet we're together. <laughs> but I always tell my students, sorry to interrupt you, but I will interrupt <laughs> you. You're directing. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> I always tell my students when they American. I, I work on an international summer school, and when the Americans come, they're really afraid of Shakespeare. They have an inferiority complex about doing Shakespeare. And I tell them, but it was the Pilgrim Fathers who left England to go to America and you speak the kind of language that Shakespeare spoke. And they immediately get much more confident, you know, because it's true, you know. That's it's right. not our very posh English. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, I want to thank the two of you for joining us. This was really brilliant, an amazing conversation, really in-depth, learning about your craft, learning about the theater, seeing some of the work, and uh, wishing you continued success and nothing but blessings in your lives. And hopefully um, when I come to Brighton one of these days, I know where to come for a spot of tea. And when you guys are over here in the States, in the area, I'm... Uh, in the greater New York area between New York and Boston on the uh, southern New England coast. Come say hello as well and uh, wish your family blessings. And uh, if people want to learn more about Brighton Theatre and things of that nature, is there a website somewhere they can go? There is a website, but we're out in the middle of updating it. So wait a week or so, please. There you is... got it. You got yeah. it. And uh, thank you so much. They're thanking us all. All loveities we are oh, now. A great you, conversation. Oh. Uh, Merlin in Canada loved it as well. Everybody loving it. Thanks for the great stories. You two are such a cute team, such a wonderful show. Thanks for sharing your time and stories with us. That's Karen in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. June, of course, our dear friend June loved every oh. second of it. Uh, all the loveities are really sharing their love. Thanks for the great conversation and the videos from Kathy Short from Juanita in South Africa. Great conversation with two lovely people. Enjoy the stories. Oh, Thank uh -huh. you. Uh, Christine Fairward in Connecticut said, English gardens are famous. Absolutely. And uh, thank you and be safe from Merlin in Canada. 
Thanks, guys. You guys are amazing, and I hope that we do. I hope uh, at some point we get together and we break bread and pour some wine, and yes, yes. You, you know that would be wonderful. George, love to you both. Oh, yes. Yeah. We, we're meant to be in New York now. With George, yeah, <laughs> we couldn't come. Yeah. So we'll be waiting for you. That's for sure. And George, welcome to our show. We're here every night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, watching on the YouTube channel. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Kathleen Walker, New York City. Thanks for sharing with us as well. More comments coming in here. Uh, Christine says, thank you all. She's in Connecticut, USA. Christine Clifton in North Carolina. Thanks to you, Richard, for sharing your stories and spending the evening with us and to you. And uh, this was an enjoyable time. Wonderful. Everybody loving it. Lots of lovity here on the show. It's gone fast. The time has gone We have been chatting for one hour and 46 minutes. Wow. And in 10 minutes, our presidential debate's going to happen. Okay. And uh, to you, I think earlier you said the word precarious. That's going to be precarious. Yeah. <laughs> like I said in the introduction, all the lovity that our viewers are going to get tonight is happening right here, right now with the three of us. We'll yeah. see what happens in 15 oh. minutes, 10 minutes. Hold your breath. <laughs> hold yeah. your breath. But it really was beautiful having you here, Claudia, Bartow. Great stories and conversation. Good to have you on the show. Uh, I'm very viewer centric, viewer interactive, even my professional work in television radio. I've always been about the audience, the viewers, the listeners, the, the viewers on television as well. And I thank you very much for your time. Uh, it really was a beautiful evening. And I hope you come back. You're welcome back anytime. The uh, link is on YouTube. If you want to share it, everybody can see it on YouTube. And um, not only are you welcome back any time, but I hope this uh, show met your expectations and you enjoyed your time with me as much as I certainly did with you both. Oh, we did. And I love the bricks, by the way. Mm. They really are lovely. <laughs> very, very British, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other, it doesn't have the ivy growing through it. <laughs> our, budget, our budget doesn't have anything in it for ivy yet, but we'll work on that. We had it all like that. That's why I love them. Yeah. Hope yes. to see you two again, yeah. and, in and in reference to the presidential debate in nine minutes, okay. going to be crazy, yes. <laughs> well, the two of you, again, blessings to you both. Thank you for all this great time, and we will have you back again, and uh, really, really enjoy this evening, and, and you. meeting you both, meeting you both. Thank you, and may America go forward in the way you would like it to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> a, little, a little giggle at the end. He's like, yeah, right. That's going to happen. <laughs> well, same with us, actually. You know, we're, we're all in the same boat, really. Yes. You know? So we must stay together, okay? Must yeah. stay together as well. Uh, good evening, Mr. Lovety. Good evening, Loveties from Linda in St. Augustine, Florida. Renee and Iowa loved it so much. She wants to watch the replay of the show already <laughs> on YouTube. You guys have a wonderful, well, it's, uh, what, almost 2 a.m. there now? It is, How yes. are we going to get to uh, no. Are you, you going to go to bed or stay up? I don't know. We can or, go to bed on a plane and come and bathe or, or I wonder if the BBC is going to carry the uh, debate, probably, I'm sure. In yes, we're going to have a look. We're going to have a look. Yeah. <laughs> you take care. It's a, pl a pleasure and a blessing. And uh, have Thank a wonderful you. evening. And thanks for staying up late with us. We really appreciated it. No, oh, thank you. And I just want to get one cry out very quickly, and that's the grandson we haven't really talked about, who is oh, called yeah. Joel. And we have a picture of him to yes. show. He is absolutely... He's the son of Leo and his husband, Roy. Whoops. His adopted son. He's a gorgeous boy. Look how beautiful he is. Yeah. And he's um, such fun. And they every so often, they all come down to Bright. We really yeah. need them to Wonderful. come. Wonderful. Good Kathleen night. says, good night, Jim and everyone. If you need a smile, this is the place to be. Yeah. The Jim Master Show Live. And I uh, hope you guys will watch the show more. Or we're, non, we're on every night, 7 p.m. Eastern. Well, you, I, well, you could watch it in the archives because it's midnight for you at 7 p.m. Yeah. yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. Well, I hope you enjoyed your time with me as much as I have with you. We did. 
We really Thanks, did. Thank you yes. very much. We haven't talked so much for ages. I know. <laughs> See? <laughs> I, that's right. I brought you two closer. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful evening. Good night, all. You got to laugh, right? You know, yeah. life could be crazy. You got to laugh. Yeah. Wonderful and good oh. stuff. And uh, Jen will not be able to go to bed unless she gets this question answered. She asks all the guests, "What? where is your Zen place, the ocean or the mountains? I live yeah. along the coast, so the ocean for me. We live yeah. on the coast. It has to be the ocean. Yeah. Yes. And I want to thank June for bringing us together. As yeah, well. it's June sort of um, yes. introduced yeah. us. So yeah. thanks, June. Absolutely. Dear, dear friend. And, uh, you know, we're so close, but we haven't seen each other because of all of this going on. So we're always texting and talking and laughing and that's what life's all about. And that's what good friendships are all about. And we have a new friendship formed right here. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The Cranes, the Williams, and the Masters. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. And to you. Bye-bye. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye now. Wonderful people, huh? Thank you, and ah, and bye. You got your question answered. A lot of people, I think if you live near the ocean, you're probably going to get more of the ocean answers, Jen. Thank you for the wonderful uh, evening. Our pleasure, our pleasure. We're going to scoot off quick because that presidential debate is coming on. We were going to do till 8.30, but such a great conversation, so much material and photos and videos. And now you got a chance to learn not only about uh, Fania Williams, a brilliant uh, international director, BBC producer, artistic director of the Brighton Theatre in Brighton, England, but also a wonderful husband, Richard Crane, another brilliant performer and artist and creator as well. And even uh, some shots of their family. Lots of creativity uh, runs through the blood there in the family, which is beautiful to see. As we always say, relax, take care of one another, breathe, love one another. We show this at the end of every show. Uh, this is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, yes, all of your characters that you look for are here. They say goodnight. Comedian George Burns is here. He says goodnight to you as well. And uh, Jeannie is in her bottle for my Jimmy Jeannie. She is uh, saying goodnight. They're all staying up to watch the presidential debate. They're not going to bed yet. Uh, silver, when I was on the TV shoot in Europe when we were in Switzerland, there's the Silver Lab from Switzerland. He says Good night to you as well. Tomorrow, we have an amazing guest. You won't want to miss the guest tomorrow. We have a brilliant, brilliant performer. She's going to perform live too. A Greek pop star turned U.S. rocker. This is uh, Marlene Angelidis. She's all excited to be here. She's going to be here tomorrow. That is Wednesday on the show. It's going to be a phenomenal show tomorrow. Really, really great show. Uh, we're so excited she was able to join us coming tomorrow and then we have a lot of other people we have uh, Heath Calvert that's on the Facebook page coming on Thursday uh, we have George Hutton coming live and direct from Ireland the brilliant Irish pop singer lyric tenor and um, singer songwriter he is going to be live and direct from Ireland he is here on Saturday night everybody's excited about that as well don't forget to join us with him Saturday night. We really can't wait. It's going to be an amazing night on Saturday. Mona, thank you very much for joining us. Good to see you. Have a great night as well. You're very welcome. And thank you, June, as well. Love you too. And um, Jen and Ken going to watch the debate. Yes, so are we. So, gang, we're going to wrap up. The debates are going to start. It's going to be a real interesting viewing. Hopefully everybody's going to be nice to each other. Uh, two others real quick. I know you guys look for Jimmy. So Jimmy's here. Jimmy says goodnight to you, my childhood toy. These are all cast of characters that were only supposed to be on the show one night. And here they are. And Gilligan from the TV show Gilligan's Island. There he is with love from Bob Denver, who played Gilligan with love from his wife. Aloha, Jim. Dream of Denver. She was a guest on our show. He was on Gilligan's Island. And the sitcom in the 60s and 70s, and also the Dolby Gellis as well. We're going to wrap up. Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. So next time, we've got four minutes till we go live with the debate. Everybody hang on. <laughs> Love you all. Thanks for all the great comments, sharing the links, watching all of these episodes. Good night, Jim. Thank you for making the evenings more fun and entertaining. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, thanks for a terrific conversation. Thanks, Christine. 
Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Jim. Have a good night, Renee and Iowa. You too. And Kathleen, thank you. Good night. Mona, good night from Louisiana, USA. Nice to have you with us as well. And I hope you'll be back regularly here. Nice to each other. Yes, I hope they are nice to each other. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, gang, we're going to sign off. Good to see you all on the Gym Masters Show Live. You take care. You be well. Love you all. And don't forget a couple of quick things here. Always don't forget to smile and share a smile with somebody. Share the lovity as we try to do every night here on the Gym Master Show Live and find your Zen place. Mine is the coast. First is with loved ones and friends, the career, music, cycling, tennis, swimming in the ocean, and uh, good things like that. All right, gang, we're going to wrap up. Good night, Jim and the Lovety family. See you all later or tomorrow. Fantastic. You too. You'll be back. Didn't Schwarzenegger say that? I'll be back. Fantastic. Three minutes and counting. All right. The Gym Masters singers and orchestra are going to get ready to play the theme, and then we are going to watch the debate. You guys have a good night. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, with wonderful singer, songwriter, and so much more. The brilliant Marlene Angelitis will be here exclusively. Good night. Mm -hmm.